on est les meilleurs. Hmm. Allez, est-ce qu'on peut y aller So, can we start Yes, it means OK. Yes. OK. Good. So, welcome to each and every one. So, we will do this session in French. So, you have interpretation. And we are happy here on that panel to be here at WeShare. We will have another conference tomorrow on the blockchain and energy because we share a lot of common views with people from WeShare because we are coming from collaborative economy and we are uh, from the press. And I follow a special line with uh, my uh, newspaper, La Tribune. So for once in a general policy discourse, we have the first minister of France, Edouard Philippe, talking about uh, artificial intelligence and saying it is already here. So it is a continuation of first uh, works that were done by Emmanuel Le Maire in, the, in that field. So you've understood, I am Philippe Mabille, I'm editorial writer at La Tribune, and with people from we share we uh, gather these people here so we will talk about artificial intelligence is it um, a way for us to better live in the cities because us at we share and here uh, in the panel we believe that technology shouldn't be uh, dominant shouldn't dominate the human being so we have debates coming from Silicon Valley on uh, how technology will transform the human being. We will have maybe chips m uh, put into our brains, etc. So we, here we will uh, see how technology can be a help for the human being. Because uh, soon two thirds of uh, the planet's inhabitants will, will live mainly in big cities, in cities. So technology is a good way for us to optimize the way cities can function, and not only in the richer countries and cities, but also I'm talking about emerging countries who've seen, uh, who are seeing their population being uh, uh, doubled or at least increased. So we're talking about smart cities. So it is really a, a Good topic, very interesting. So we will talk about it with the different speakers. I will briefly interest them. We have Guillaume de Vauchel, is the Innovation and Scientific Development at Valeo, because uh, autonomous cars, it is a smart, uh, it is intelligence. We have Stéphane Mallard, who is a digital evangelist at Blue Age. So will explain to us what is uh, what is it to be a digital evangelist. We will have the pleasure to have Isabelle falque Pirotin, who is a deputy chair of the CNIL, the French Commission for um, Liberties. So we have to make sure that um, data uh, is well protected, and uh, it is important for us if we want to mention artificial intelligence. We will also have Louisa Mena. She's Franco-Irish, French and Irish. She's the co-founder of Lemon Citron in French. It is a chatbot. It's a type of in artificial intelligence that will recommend specific places to visit. And last but not least, we have Philip Guy, Philip Goldstein, senior analyst at Wikistrat. They're talking a lot about cybersecurity. And without further ado, we will have this debate. And also, you can have the floor because you're not very numerous tonight. But maybe uh, we can have Philip. No, maybe. They can do it with other slides. Oh, we have the slides. So maybe briefly we can talk about cyber cities. Présentez rapidement. Thank you for the introduction. So just a quick presentation on cyber cities, on the subject of cities and digital questions, digital issues, or questions of cyber security nowadays, because there's a revolution 
two revolutions that are clashing, converging. There is revolution in cities and the digital revolution too. So this digital revolution, firstly, well, you can say that in uh, the end of the 90s, it conquered the information universe because it's at that point that all the information that we recorded, communicated, was coded in zeros and one. And as Marc and Rezin said in 2011, that's the point where software swallowed the world up. As for cities, well, this transformation that follows, uh, we think that by the end of this decade, we'll have investments of about $9 billion, nine, um, no, nine, $9 trillion in what we call smart cities. There's also something we call an older revolution, the revolution that started with the Industrial Revolution, as was said, just before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the urban revolution, the urban population was only about 3% of the uh, human population. Nowadays, it's about 50% by the middle of the 20th 20th century, so it'll be out 70% by 2050. And there's a huge concentration of people in cities, and there's also a concentration of wealth in the cities. It's linked in part to this digital revolution. Um, cities of these little network, which are very dense, close-knit, where it's easy to find people who work, information, and human beings. So traditionally, these are places where innovation can develop itself. And in a capitalist economy whose value is mostly powered by innovation, that's where their wealth is concentrated. That's what we see in the United States when we take the 366 counties in the US, it's the 50 metropolitan counties that have three quarters of the wealthiest um, households. So cities are rich targets, so critical targets for cyber safety because this digital revolution has a darker side to it. And when you ask nowadays uh, experts who manufacture smart cities, they recognize it quite clearly. We've got a slide here that shows that more than 85% of experts who work on the question of smart cities identify that there can be major serious issues linked to these smart cities. And the basic point is that of a difference than what we saw in cyber criminality where we lost money, we touch on things that are far more sensitive because these digital elements will be active. So up here on the screen, this is the Carmel Tunnel in Haifa in Israel. It was blocked in October 2013 for several days. That led to major gridlock because the, the video monitoring system inside the tunnel had been hacked. And as it had been hacked, we decided cars couldn't go through, even though cars could have been able to go through. Why was that? Because when you're talking about human safety and you don't play around with human safety, basically. Now, you can see that this digital area with connected object with its capacity to touch upon human beings is going to move on to a new level of awareness and understanding of risk. We saw this in 2016 with all these ransomwares against hospitals in the NHS, which directly targeted patients, and there was a whole series of attacks in urban areas in the past decades. Take, for example, what happened in San Francisco underground, and also what happened in Kiev for the electricity uh, distribution that was stopped. Uh, there was buildings in Finland too, which were attacked by Lynx service, and this stopped central heating and hot water from being acceptable, even though we were at below zero temperatures. So this digital revolution is vulnerable. It can attack the heart of our economic and social resilience. So this is a revolution and a vulnerability that is going to go crescendo. So by the end of this decade, we will as we've already said, we have human, uh, computers that will have the same calculation capacity as a human brain. We'll need 50 to 20 years to find what we see in labs in the shop. So just imagine what calculation capacities will be in our hands in 15 to 20 years. And then there's people from Salesforce who think that by 15 to 20 years, we'll have more than 20. 
a 20, no, 2 trillion connected object um, and we'll have more and more people. So this mass of agents, automata, and smart tools that can move around are going to concentrate where? Well, in the cities, because that's where we have most of our wealth. And that's the very heart of a problem. But we do have solutions that are emerging. The first solutions, we talk a lot about dark nets, but we could talk about a white net too, a collective defense system that's emerging nowadays that links states, research institutions, people who, private cybersecurity actors who, thanks to an information sharing network that's more automated, more standardized, means we can face up to the threats and cities that have this knowledge of operational techniques will have their part to play in this network that's emerging. And another pillar of this cyber defense of the city of the future is simulation. Now, simulation is useful to try and understand systems that are very complex to try and solve these wiki, these problems, wiki problems. So in the face of a city, the system of a system, this simulation can be useful. It's already used nowadays in terms of research to try and understand where the weaknesses of a network are. We can imagine ISIS, we can imagine emerging of these elements. And the simulation is also used nowadays operationally in defense for creating this sort of wall, great barrier of illusions to protect the systems. And it's in these uh, sort of barrier of illusions. Um, they all think they're attacking real assets. They're attacking false assets. So basically, gradually, we're going to be able to take over in this question of cyber defense and what's interesting with these military tools. And I'm just going to close with that. We have we have a dual use and if we have simulation systems that allow us to develop and optimize our defense system we have some city usage systems that allow us to simulate and develop the usage of a city that will be in the hands of municipal governments and also the municipal opposition and activists and it's also going to be in everyone's hands basically so that's where there's this possibility, uh, maybe not so far away, of a change in governance. If that's more horizontal, where these city tools will be distributed and will, to use this metaphor of a city as a political center, and the very way in which we do politics will be changed. So that's one of the potential revolutions of its convergence between the digital revolution and the city revolution. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Philippe. That was fascinating and quite reassuring, too. So, moving on, I'm going to ask Stéphane uh, Mallard just to give you a bit more context. I believe you're all geeks. You know what the Tribune is. What is? What do we talk about? What do we mean when we talk about artificial intelligence? What typology is there? What kind of new services? Well, we're thinking of this, which is as powerful as the supercomputers of a 70, but with a cloud is even more powerful and so on. And we don't know anything anyway. Could you give us a bit of an overview? And then we'll go and ask what these new services mean? Well, artificial intelligence. Well, it's not that complex. When you talk about artificial intelligence, it's, it's scary. You think it's engineers and geeks, but it's actually very simple. What happens is we have evolutions that uh, were created a few years ago, but they're gradually percolating down calculation capacities and so on. We've basically turned around our approach to I2. Since we've been creating machines, we program them. We we give them rules with data to have behaviors. That's the software you've been using from the get-go. You click and you know what's going to happen. It's programmed, no intelligence there. But we now understand that human intelligence does the opposite. A baby doesn't need to learn the rules, grammar rules, to learn to speak. He can hear, or she can hear people talking about them, and he understand grammar without even know that, knowing that grammar exists. And it's exactly the same with AI. We expose machines to data, and we make them discover their own working rules to the 
can understand what's going on in their environment to adapt their behavior with objectives and so on and so forth. We use algorithms that are moving closer and closer to how our brain works. We're talking about deep neuronal networks. We're talking about learning and reinforced learning. That's another trend. And all that means that gradually, everything that our brain does, our computer, a machine can do. Now, we're just taking baby steps now. We're not at the level of our brain, but all our cognitive capacities are being mobilized by this. So, for example, we can give a vision to machines. These algorithms allow machines to recognize what's in the environment. And you're the one who teach them, when you tag someone on Facebook, you learn to machine, teach a machine what's in the photo, and then they can include it in the algorithm to recognize who's on the picture. That's what we use for Google Cars, for example. So there used to be another technique that taught machines to adopt behaviors to reach their objectives by themselves. We used to do that to play video games, because we were playing video games on the screen with pixels by ourselves. But we can gradually, uh, we did this lately, um, We've had a computer who beat a human being on a game of Go, but find molecules to find cancer with smart assistants too, who will basically replace our smartphones. The dream assistant that can do everything our smartphone does, but smartly, will be able to ask him to do this, but they'll be an expert in every area. It's not exactly going to be the same form, and our smartphones can have this dimension. These interfaces, it could be glasses, it could be a chip implanted somewhere where you'll have them all over the place, but we'll talk about that later. We'll have them in our object, there won't be touch screens or buttons on our washing machine. We'll speak to our smart assistant. You'll have a smart assistant who'll be your digital alter ego, who'll be your copy in a digital world, who'll represent you in your interaction. My smart assistant's gonna to speak to yours to talk about logistics. Um, they'll talk with your doctors, your bankers, AI. So we'll have a whole system of smart assistants who'll communicate amongst themselves. So we're going to have an AI that will be portable, mobile, and personal, which will be attached to us. Yes, exactly, to us personally, but companies will have this too. In the future, your smart assistant is going to interact with the companies with which you work, on the products that you work by, and so on, for your smart assistant and theirs, and they'll solve the problems amongst themselves, the problems who are going to apply to companies in the future. Instead of using a channel, internet, or a chatbot, their smart intelligence is going to be their uh, digital butler who's going to talk with a company. So could you tell me, we're talking about chatbots. Yes, we'll talk about chatbots later, but the typology in the cities. We uh, look a lot at what smart startups do in the cities and so on. Will you look at all these apps? It's a service for for city. Now, people who don't live in the cities can use them too. I mean, we don't want people who live in uh, the peripheral areas to be left out, but it's a question of this technology not being reserved to the rich, but it's true. When you look at how people use their phones, when it comes to concentration, it's mostly in the cities. What exists already? Please explain what exists. We use IA, um, artificial intelligence nowadays in all areas. We already do amazing stuff. Machines that can find molecules against cancer, who uh, can do research, who can give diagnoses on all sorts of diseases. Mark Zuckerberg said we'd be able to solve, um, cure all diseases by the end of the century. We do this to drive cars, to pilot planes. It's getting better. We're using it in finance, too, to set up uh, files, back offices, and financial market in the law, because the law is logic that finds arguments, that drafts papers. But the fact is that computers, um, uh, um, sorry, lawyers want to do the same. Um, law corporations want to do the same. We use it in telecoms, too. We also use it in the industry, in logistics, in arts. All these algorithms allow us to throw hypotheses in uh, these work of art. They, we could use these hypotheses to create something new. Creativity uses these elements, and machines are starting to do this. All these exceptions, all areas are touched by IA. AI, sorry, um, it's going to change everything. It's going to change how we organize ourselves, our relationship with work, the place of mankind in society. 
uh, the world is now a community thanks to the intention, intelligence, understanding, expertise. I think student artificial intelligence expertise is also going to become a community. The commun knowledge is a community and expertise will shortly be, but not at the same level in every area. There's breaks, there's challenges, and so on and so forth. What's going to be left over is what makes us human beings our interaction, love, culture, what makes us be human beings, what makes us interact. Okay, Alexander, two applications in the real world. So first, we'll start with you, Guillaume. Duchenne for Valeo. Valeo, uh, you used to be a car equipment maker, but now you completely changed. You're a company that's invested. You're a first boss of investment and research, and you've invested a lot of your turnaround during the 2009 crisis to work on these special sensors, smart cameras. And the idea already was this vision of 2009 that culture was going to be connected and it was going to be autonomous in the future. So we've got these autonomous, we said we may have an autonomous car by 2020, but it's already on the roads. Could you tell us a bit about this, uh, where we are, basically, and what we can do? Yes. Ten years ago, Velio uh, said something that seems so obvious today. The improvement, the continuous improvement in the car industry in the past 50 years, the next generation of vehicles will be more powerful, more reliable, more lighter, and so on and so forth, more comfortable. And that um, was going to lead to uh, would have an impact on concentration of wealth in the city of need for um, this. It's the end of this car that we use on a daily basis to get around the city and go on holidays and so on. For this usage, vehicles aren't well adapted. We've got 1.1% uh, 1.1 person per car on board, so these cars are wasted space um, in Paris the average speed is 15 kilometers an hour and so on and so forth for driving conditions are so bad but a car when you buy it you use it between three to seven percent of the time 93 to 97 percent of the time your car is just in a garage or on the sidewalk next to the sidewalk so cars aren't used properly so we started with this realization we said this revolution I have three pillars. First of all, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and pollution uh, in the cities. It's not the same for interurban um, trips. Mr. Hulot said that by 2030 he'd ban all pe petrol and uh, diesel cars. Yes. Then, an autonomous vehicle. Because if you're a driver, a user, well, you're probably aware that you spend hours on the Paris Ring Road. So there's this need to get this time back that's been confiscated by cars and autonomous. Why? It's connected because this free time isn't time you want for yourself. You want it for your environment. You want to be connected. You want it to be seamless. You want the same experience when you're at home. So we based ourselves on these three pillars and thought, what is the city of the future? We said that the future, car of the future, would be anything but the extrapolation of a car of today. Don't think of the mobility of the future in the eyes of today. We're living this revolution. I just wanted to talk about um, artificial intelligence and this revolution. Humanity has seen uh, one period. Take the 1500s with library. The library is more memory than a man. Then there was, for example, automation that was going to kill manual work. Then computers, well, it never happened. And here, uh, math-wise, it's quite complex. It's a different level of complexity of the subjects, uh, especially in the cities, is such that Good old algorithms are completely inefficient. Just to take one example, to park your car. I mean, it's easy, you just change the gears and so on. 10,000 
lines of code, several hours of engineering. So the problem of self-driving cars is really complex, horribly, um, almost impossible. So we need a paradigm shift in artificial intelligence. You feel like the car's becoming smart. No, not at all. It's just learned differently. We used to say that computers were going to become smart, but no one thinks their mobile lap their laptop computer is really smart. You, f you think it's well, rather annoying, not very practical. Its battery doesn't last long. You want us, we want it to do stuff for us, and it's starting this assistant and so on. There is some stuff that's quite marvelous in electronics and artificial intelligence. The cameras are far better than our eyes, far more efficient. The cameras uh, are uh, still on when we get back from discos and so on. So they're not drunk like us. So we've got improvement when it comes to safety and security. So that's the first objective. We're expecting a reduction of the amount of reduction, a division by 10 or 100. To talk about France, 3,000 deaths a year, 300 or even only 30. What we want is for 10 minus 9. Sorry, I'm using technical terms. So one defect per billion kilometers. We've had 56 billion kilometers covered in France so that's 56 big accidents I mean that's just a statistic but between 10 and uh, 200 it's not zero it's not going to solve all ethical problems we're not going to solve all these issues of zero deaths it's not absolute it's basically a lot better I was very lucky I drove in a car that had eyes and ears you associate from the LAO, you associated yourselves with Safran. It works, it's great, it's amazing. We've had a few tests. I think that Las Vegas had the last C years. I think they did Las Vegas. San Francisco in a smart car. So where are we? And what do you do? Are you also part of this um, artificial intelligence? Or do you let Googles and Apples do it? Are you working more on the equipment that allows us to make cars smart? So what we do is first we have captors so they will replace human senses. Let's imagine you were uh, to work uh, with your eyes shut. So it's the same for the vehicle. So we have three different indicators, physically different. So at Valeo, this is what we're doing. We have three different cameras and we develop the um, radars as well. So to simplify, we can recognize if it's a vehicle, a truck, a human being, a bicycle, but we can't be sure because artificial intelligence, it's not between one and zero. It's more complicated and then the camera will see an object and we will try and ask the scanner if, let's say, is this um, object in three dimensions. So it is not about a video image. And then we will ask the radar to see the difference in the speed. And then, in the end, we will be absolutely certain that this is a passerby that is working at this specific speed, and it is a potential risk. So this is already a real success for uh, AI. Uh, AI. So then, second uh, possible use, what do we do now with this information? So let's take the example of the uh, the. Um, the code uh, for drivers. So I'm sure young people are waiting impatiently for these uh, specific autonomous cars. And you see specific uh, slides, you see someone in your rear mirror and you cannot, uh, you cannot move anymore. So if you don't have a uh, this ability to see by yourself, then uh, AI is not enough. So you need a second algorithm. So we had a lot of conversation with the public uh, authorities 
to make sure we had not to change the highway code, uh, we had to make sure that the A and I, it's not just the continuity of the way we drive now, we have to completely understand how we can live now with a new object. So we will need to change infrastructures as well. Road infrastructures? Well, first, no, not necessarily, because we will have autonomous cars or A and AI cars quite uh, rapidly by 2020. You will also have specific um, uh, without drivers uh, vehicles. Uh, there are some already being implemented in Lyon, for instance. Then if we were to mention Cantal or Lozère, specific regions where it snows, uh, this is uh, more tricky. You know, we have Jacques Mézard that joined us. He is a former senator for Cantal. He rapidly went to agriculture and is about now he's dealing with the cohesion of territories. So it's visiting us. So no, but uh, for specific uh, activities, it will be able to use those vehicles by 2020. You will drive them for one or two hours a day, etc., or helping people. Um, and then we'll have another layer thanks to AI, because we say autonomous driving, but not all the time. So uh, to what extent will these cars be able to take charge when the drivers are not driving anymore? So then we will need specific captors. We will need a specific uh, ability to be recognized. So what will you do then with all the data? It is extremely difficult. After that, you have the second layer, which is called end-to-end -end, uh, AI. It means that the uh, car will behave, if you want, more and more how you would want it to behave. So they will know your desires, your habits. It is like a driver that knows you really well. So imagine I'm a really brutal driver, then the car will be brutal as well. Well, it is all, uh, this is about ethics, so it is a bit different. We have a, a study that is being carried out at the moment. They're studying if, depending on the situation, if it's about young people, older people, black and white people, how would they react? So it is a quite a uh, detailed study. So what would the car do in such specific cases? So in fact, you have to be aware that the car will take a decision, make a decision every five milliseconds. So of course, there will be some cases, let's say one on uh, one billion case, when you have uh, someone walking uh, suddenly and this will be uh, an issue but imagine if you are an impatient driver let's say you have a sportive way of uh, driving so will you uh, give the hand to your car that will drive more safely or will your car adapt to your needs it is about adapt ability of this function. So we do believe that our role as a tribune and as uh, industrial people is to allow us to um, experiment. And also we will learn a lot from our mistakes because this is what we say. Uh, the AI learns until uh, they succeed. So we have to do that with a quite intense rhythm. We need to fulfill uh, the dire the desires society has. And I will always uh, quote a philosopher. Uh, this is André Comte, because uh, the roi Féléon, so about the lazy kings that used to, uh, before, they used to have specific carriage because they were too lazy to walk. So it was an easy way for them to uh, to collect taxes.
So once they became richer, they didn't have better carriages. It was true for the Renaissance period. So we cannot do the same. Let's not look at um, the vehicle of tomorrow like a bigger carriage. So we just need to imagine what can happen. Because if we were to look back at what we imagined in, 90, in the 1950s, for instance, for the future, we see today that it is completely old-fashioned. So we cannot really imagine what will happen in 20 years from now on. Maybe in 20 years, our cars will fly. It is already the case now. We already have those cars. Maybe it is easier to have an autonomous car that flies because there are less obstacles. But of course, our aim is to have a car with no wheels. So now uh, we give the floor to Lisa Menard. Louisa Menard. Maybe you can give us your vision of uh, applications of AIs, new usage. So we have another view, which is we wanted to use technology to create a link because our society is more and more dehumanized, people feel lonely, they spend a lot of time being alone. So how could we create links? So we created a virtual friend to whom we can discuss. So they will recommend us places, etc. It is to create a link. So Facebook, it is what we call a chat bot. So it's a robot with whom we chat. It is a way to uh, give this ability to people. So when we launched uh, this specific uh, platform, Citron, so it was just a simple, silly thing like yes and if not or if yes. So now it's changed. It's uh, we have launched. We've launched the French and the English version. The English version is really younger. It's like a child. If you don't talk to him or talk to them, they won't learn. So they will adapt themselves to your reactions. So today our vision of a smart city, it's a smarter city. How can we come up with a smarter city? And it is still in that vision of how can we have a smart robot? So we are working on the predictive aspect. We are collecting data so we can predict a lot, whether where people live, what are their consumer habits, what do they do. And in all this smart city field, then we can predict if there will be a, an issue with the driving, etc. So. Uh, at the moment, we recommend places in French and in English. For instance, we have the NLP uh, translation part. And it takes time, of course. So what are the uses? Can it be elsewhere than in Paris? Can it be for, let's Imagine I'm in Limoges and I have Citron. What happens on my messenger? So I just chose uh, Limoges by completely by chance. So imagine you will chat with Citron. Then after a few exchanges, they will get to know you. They will locate you. So first it is a chat. You are the one initiating this discussion. And this uh, application will be more and more able to predict what you want to do. So first, we are at the, uh, at the moment, we are at the first step. We are just recommending things. So isn't it a bit like in Minority Report, that movie, when you receive, people receive personalized ads, you know? Everyone sees what they want to see, in a way. So isn't it a bit dangerous because you're talking about living better? So I see the applications, but it is good to uh, have 
quicker data, but uh, how is it not about manipulation? Well, we have at the moment about uh, 5,000 users in a few months, and not everyone realizes it is a robot. Some people do believe it is about a person. We receive pictures every day, we receive phone calls, etc., because we've humanized this relationship. Because, in fact, nobody wants a robot to recommend places. So it could be a robot to whom we can ask for a specific poem. Well, uh, nobody fell in love with the robot yet, but <laughs> OK, because a lemon is a bit sour. That's why. But let's imagine Pokemon. Uh, one year ago, you had to find the rarest Pokemon, etc. And people, they, become, they became crazy. We received uh, love letters, etc. Even if people they knew it was a robot. So we're mentioning cities. So do you also have contacts in other small towns? And do you have contacts with the mayor of the? Uh, town halls, etc., of each cities, because it can be good a touristic value to... Yes, we work with uh, tourist places, with specific societies. Uh, we were successful at the uh, specific challenge, prediction challenge, so it is good for train stations, airports. When we travel, when we are mobile, we can find it useful to have this relationship. So were you able to guarantee uh, the success? Because uh, for Pokemon, people said uh, hackers were using uh, data, etc. So can we hack Citron? Did you take that uh, possibility into consideration? We are starting to, because we've reached a level uh, of data that is interesting concerning security. So we have a team, 90% of our team is made of engineers. And because we are on Facebook, we also work with the CNIL, etc. So good transition. So. It was made on purpose. By the way, Isabelle Falk Pierrotin, you are deputy chair of the CNIL. Maybe you have a reaction from uh, to what was said, and it would be interesting to you for us that you explain what is uh, the role of the CNIL, what they do. So does it check that we stay safe? But it also has probably a new role with this. Uh, this new technology and this AI also, AI that needs data and that tomorrow will be maybe autonomous. So how do you look at this? Because you are about IT and freedom as well. So I reacted on that level in my introduction. You said when you introduced me that I was in charge of data. Well, you know, it's really significant because the CNIL is not uh, the policeman of IT, but the role is to be in charge of the design of the city. So what is it? Is it about architecture, economic and technical uh, point of view? But it is also a human point of view. So CNIL is about making sure that innovation and digital innovation can uh, increase, but still while respecting uh, rights of uh, the people. So LIA can also help regulators to work, because we are starting to see new softwares that uh, allow people to go under the terms and conditions that nobody really reads and to sum it up, 
to be useful for other people. So in a way, it is it brings a lot of good things. But the issue is that the Ilya is the um, artificial intelligence is built on data. So this black box for people, how can it produce a specific result we are hoping for? So practically, how did the CNIL work on that topic? So we had this mission to think about questions relating to digital, uh, to the digital field. So we've been considering algorithms. So we see few things. We see that the uh, I, the AI, can take a decision, or is it? an assistant to decision making and how can we ensure that it stays an assistant and that it doesn't take the role of a human being so first question second question is then if we take the example of connected or autonomous car we see that this car will probably have to be in charge of deciding when driving, if uh, they have to choose for this obstacle or this one, and maybe a human obstacle. So there will be a choice to make. And this is what we say, that this choice is already made beforehand. Yes, it is made beforehand with the developer, the uh, constructor manufacturer but it is not a choice that is made by the driver by the human driver so what is uh, difficult is to forget social pacts on which we need to have a collective discussion so we are talking here about vehicles but we could imagine AI that will have to decide on difficult on specific medication or therapy and we see that probably we will be there one uh, one day. And who will be in charge of making that decision? Will we decide to uh, to give specific medication for uh, people aged between 30 to 40, or that beyond a certain age, we will decide that it's not worth uh, curing a specific uh, cur curing someone anymore so we need to uh, make a decision we had a poll thanks to ifob it was extremely interesting we asked the question of algorithms and ai and we found out that people they feel that uh, algorithms are ruling the day-to-day -day life but at the same time all uh, said they don't understand a thing about this. So the issue is not that they do not understand. So it is not just about understanding and grasping the concept better, but the issue is that they do not understand what is lying behind the ANI. The thing is, the public would like um, public policies being discussed more. So this is a series of questions we are uh, thinking about uh, in this uh, collective debate. And we do that along with uh, more than 40 partners. And by the end of this year, we will have a collective restitution of the results of this public debate. And this will be extremely interesting because, of course, um, the technical and industrial side is at stake, but also there is another dim dimension, a human dimension, ethical as well, even spiritual, maybe, if we start to think that robots could start thinking by themselves, being really autonomous. And we feel that the French population wants to have its say. And also, maybe that it could be a debate on fake news as well, and the uh, 
power of algorithms, like in Facebook. This would uh, help us understand that we are in, a, let's say, a bubble, a specific bubble. And if we receive the same sort of news all the time, then we cannot uh, access new information. So is the CNIL involved in this right to information as well? Yes, indeed. And we could also act because in the CNIL law and also like uh, in also with the new digital law, if a decision is opposed to a human be to someone, there is this possibility to to contradict the decision that was made. People could ask uh, for these algorithms. It is a, a way of um, looking at accountability. And when we go back to this idea of uh, this black box, people could open it, but they won't necessarily be um, given the uh, source code because it is about it is technician's role, technician's job. Uh, look at the APB software. So the uh, software for the French baccalaureate. So this specific software has been questioned because uh, people uh, are wondering today, why have I been chosen? Uh, because I wasn't aware of this um, way of functioning. So we see there are a, a growing number, a growing series of issues, and people will ask for the uh, explanations or so two reactions maybe stefan briefly concerning fake news we are starting to have really uh, powerful algorithms so and it works it works really well concerning the bubble you are right it is a risk when you go on amazon you buy a specific pair of shoes and they will recommend you something else that is linked so of course if you buy your newspaper it is the same they will uh, give you ads according to what you bought so it is reinforced reinforced by these algorithms so this is a, a danger but the idea will be to uh, offer you other products that you wouldn't think about and then last point when it's about democracy we can imagine that at one point, algorithms will take decisions for us. So maybe it is a bit absurd for you, but today, look at some of our politicians. They used algorithms for the, uh, their electoral campaigns, presidential campaigns. So imagine. For us citizens, we will have to make sure we are part of the decision-making, the decision process of tomorrow. We will have to uh, choose what data we give to the uh, AI. And we will have to make sure that someone decides if algorithms are not dangerous and how we can give certificates, how we can validate them, etc. So just two seconds, uh, a point to what you just said. So why can we say that uh, artificial intelligence, it's like a morning, morning of perfection, because a uh, computer is about O and 1. So it goes back to Greek uh, civilization with this specific myth, uh, Prometheus myth, when the creature surpassed uh, its creator. I could give you a source code of an algorithm, that's my know-how, but I can't tell you what product is going to come from artificial intelligence. We've learned the behavior of a product is actually quite independent from the 
for software, the creature goes beyond our understanding today. There's uh, Stefanoki's fear, who says we need to watch out with what we're doing in this area, because we may lose the control of it. And one day, an artificial intelligence that's strong, it would wake up pretty much uh, just by a stroke of bad luck. And that day, well, we'd be in a very difficult situation. It's a th fear we have every time there's a break. We had it with computers or TV 20 years ago. All the uh, housewives were really scared that their children would watch TV. Nowadays, kids watch TV all, all day long. So this happens all the time. And I completely agree with what you're saying. Those who generate object usages, your authorities, different points of view, they join. And for me, the point that comes from on cars, cars were unique, connected, autonomous, smart cars. It's but within this system, and this is new, and this system is enlightened by all sorts of different aspects, and no one can claim that they understand all these aspects. But everyone must bring their, play their part, do something for all this. Just two points we've talked about. We talked about the fantasy on the control of the machines. Let's watch out for anthropomorphism. Machines, robots don't want to reproduce and look for mates to reproduce. Machines aren't necessarily homo sapiens. They don't live in a hierarchy using the violence. That's one of the realities of our species. It can be if we impose uh, design, we need to watch out for these anthropomorphical projections. Moreover, on these questions of accountability, it's fundamental, it's essential. And there's nowadays some APA research programs to try and understand what is in this research in this black box, like if it's military applications. If I use a smart machine to knock down my opponent, and that unfortunately there's a lot more collateral damage than we could have done, no political power would have been able to say, no, I'm sorry, it's not my fault, it's a machine. We need this accountability at the military level and the civilian level. And if we manage to have this accountability, we'll have a break on the adoption of this inter artificial intelligence. Louisa, can artificial intelligence help out? And is, the, is it naive to think it's going to lead to progress? Does this worry you, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Well, I think it depends how we use it. It's the use of this um, new technology. We try and surprise the users. Surprise, it's complex. We create an algorithm for it to be automated and for it to be recommendations and so on and so forth. How do human beings want to be surprised? And it's reproducing human behaviors by adding intelligence, adding lots of stuff. And we base this human behavior. Humans can be good, as they can be not as good. They've got their advantages. They've got their drawbacks. So I really am on board with this idea of human behavior to create smarter groups that are faster. And just to finish with a story now, quite a few books came out. One I saw recently was talking about the awakening of an IA that was written by Roland Berger, The Awakening of intelligent, Artificial Intelligence, and what happens with this artificial intelligence. There are several theories, and one of the theories is what, say, what are we going to want? They want to make sure that they survive. Not reproduction, but they want to manage their energy supply and to make sure that its energy resource is sustainable, they'll have the COP21 at the power end to make sure that the planet can last forever. And that's going to lead to a question. It's not that the machine is nasty or bad. It's just the most rational thing for artificial intelligence would be to park human beings in a huge video game and to send you back to um, Mr. Musk's said the probability that we're not already in the matrix in a video game is one in a billion. That's Elon Musk. But philosophically and mathematically, it's, uh, yes, that's the case. We'll talk about that later. The argument of assimilation has been parachuted. So the final 
word I'd like to say for the matrix scenario. Yes, it is. It's the matrix scenario. There's also 2001 Space Odyssey. We all have a reference to this. We'll take your question, but first, Minister, please surprise us. We may be surprising you. We're going to give you a mic in a few minutes to speak. Your name is Jacques Mézard. You're in charge of territorial cohesion and cities. And please, you have a floor. Tell us what you thought, what you had. We were talking about the fact that the Prime Minister talked about artificial intelligence in um, his speech yesterday. Well, good evening to you all. I wanted to come tonight to instruct myself to learn as a political representative and the president of Agnil will not save a country, a political representative must listen because there's quite a few decisions to be made and to be applied. And I'm one of those people that are convinced that this question of artificial intelligence is essential because we're there already and we'll be there even more, more than the evolutions and sociological, technological mutations are moving forward so fast that it's no longer arithmetical, but it's geometrical. So a political representative who's not interested in this would worry me. Doesn't mean that what's happening doesn't worry me. We need to transform this worry into trust because all these evolutions generate crises will generate crises, ethical, philosophical, social, technological crises. And it is essential to anticipate these crises and not suffer them. The prime minister used these words. The president, the French president, has already used them during his campaign. And I can say, well, we are convinced, we are certain that these subjects are essential. They're essential for life, for our life in all societies. It's global. Those who want to rebuild walls and borders haven't understood anything. We're in globalization. Well, if we're in a global world, you can think what you want of it. We're trying to make sure that it's more productive and destructive, but it's there, globalization there. And artificial intelligence is there. Um, these quantic computers already exist as well. And I heard some words that both, uh, well, rejoice me when I say, hear Louisa say that we use robots to humanize human relationships. It's a beautiful sentence. And it's quite well suited to the reality. And it's going to be increasingly the case. When I hear Uh, what, for example, I've heard on the legal, on the ethical risks, the legal risks, these are essential questions. These are basic questions. There's a question of responsibility. The people who work on smart cars know that ethics and responsibility, even if there's 100 times less accidents, the responsibility of these accidents will basically be a real legal issue, but it's going to come, it's going to happen, and we're going to have to sort it out. I'm one of those people who think we need to take care of these problems instead of just reacting to them and just suffering them, because this is going to revolutionize the working of our institutions, all the working of our institutions, our laws. Our laws, even though we know we make lots of laws, too many actually, off mic, sorry. We'll try, but it doesn't mean that we'll make it easily. But anyway, it's already going to be a problem and that imposes means that we need legislative, legal, regulatory solutions to these questions, these issues. And uh, just moving on to another subject, I can see the positive point. You've talked about mobility. I'm in charge of housing, territorial cohesion. It's true 
with artificial intelligence in comparison with women and men who are losing autonomy, where it's a lot of hope, infinite hope, actually. And we also need to think about the positive side of things. Someone was talking about the Cantal region. I'm from the same region, actually. And please do go to Lache and you'll see what rural France is. And we do need an artificial intelligence to make things easier for us out there. Now, it's true. It's most probably going to allow us to move forwards in the right direction. I'm in charge of housing, as I said. In housing, IA is almost there, it's on its way, and it's going to suppress lots of things, and it's also going to bring lots of comfort, often, I hope, for the most vulnerable citizens. That's also the duty and the responsibility of a politician. They must say that this exists nowadays, political representatives who don't know we have these issues. Well, we need to be a bit... I find that worrying, and I think it's good that the Prime Minister and the French President said, OK, this is an issue. It's an issue. Um, as the President of the CNIL said, he's in this, and a huge responsibility when it comes to protecting people. All this is a lot of work that we're going to have to carry out together. Artificial intelligence, collaborative economy, and so on and so forth. We understand that many citizens are terrified that artificial intelligence is going to take over. Maybe it would be wiser than us. We're not very wise sometimes, but it could be the opposite. Who knows? I'm one of those people who trust in humanity and its capacity to innovate in all areas. With all these um, uh, things that are going. What happened in 1945 with the atomic bomb? Well, that was another revolution. We realized that we were capable of creating instrument that we did no longer, we no longer managed. The real question is having the capacity for these instruments to be created, developed, and for us to go on managing them, mastering them. And that's also a collective responsibility. It's a real responsibility that we have in a world which is a dangerous world. Unfortunately, internationally and globally, it's more and more dangerous. So these are the responsibilities of those who have a capacity, even if we doubt that they completely have it, those who have a capacity to decide, and it's our responsibility. What worries me, and always worries me in a public and political life, is that in politics, they follow society, but at the last minute they say, oh, this exists, oh, dish, dear. And we try and make up for the difficulties of the moment, even though we must try and foresee and anticipate things. What's difficult in the world of politics, in um, the best of politics, the life of a city, we need to keep this capacity to anticipate and to see the way in which things can develop. The Secretary of State I work with, he's from Normandy, he's 37. He's quite a very smart, bright guy, and he really does fit in today's and tomorrow's world. In our offices, we've got someone who's thinking Yes, he's thinking. He's thinking, he's taking time to think. Taking time to listen. I'm going to see, it may surprise you, but uh, off mic, sorry if the interpreter can't hear. No, that's a mistake. As we have a minister and a secretary of state, it's 15. 15. And as we are mutualizing things as much as possible, which allows us to do this, it gives us a critical approach on the decision of the executive power. 
and as soon as we try and reduce our head count, they're reproaching, they're saying that free administration has no work. So I'm, what I'm saying is, I'm not surprised by what I hear, but I'm certain that if we were four times more numerous, we'd have four times more experience, four times more diversity, and all this we need to use it to improve our citizens' comfort and in a real communication issue too, actually. I don't really, I'm not that fond of the media, but that's something many people feel, I believe, said, the speaker said of Mike, but medias get the right messages across. They explain things because we need it. I was talking to Journée de l'Enrue of his question of uh, image, the image of our neighborhood. It was people who lived in difficult neighborhood. It's essential to develop a positive image of these neighborhoods because a positive image is a first step towards moving forward up and better. We mustn't be scared of communicating. We mustn't say, oh, that's such an accumulation of dangerous issues that, well, let uh, specialists talk about them. And it doesn't interest Mr. Dupont and Mr. Dupont and Mr. Durand, Mr. Smith and Mr. Smith. Um, whereas it really interests Mr. Smith and Mr. Smith more than anyone else. Could we just uh, prolong? I'm going to basically express my surprise to you. You're in charge of territorial cohesion. And in what was said by Emmanuel Macron, we hear that this question of inclusion, equal, equal access, not uh, people putting people under house arrest. When you look at these questions of technology, there's this question of access, where's benefits? We're talking about risk, but there's benefits. How can this be accessible to all? Is that not also the responsibility of the referee, that the state is to in create the conditions that technology is good for everyone? Well, it's our duty. I believe in the state that's a strategist. The state that's a strategist fixes major orientations. As the president said, I've el been elected by the French to work on a program to go in this or that direction. And uh, what happened hadn't been, this year hasn't been forecast yet, hadn't been forecast one year ago. Many things are possible and in all areas. And this question of inclusion, these technological evolutions, I don't know if we'll manage, but it may, must be one of the preferred ways of allowing territories that have more difficulties than other to not only make up for lost time, but also to get ahead of the curve, take difficult neighborhood, take the suburbs of big cities, rural territories, which aren't all in the same state. So we need to start with a start. We need to start with we're talking about 4G tomorrow. We've got 1G, and if you're lucky. But if you're in Cantal, I could tell you about lots of areas where they don't even have 1G. Things happen differently. It's not completely true. But tomorrow, I'm going to meet operators, and we're going to send them um, a frank message, a fi firm but decent. Thank you for uh, accepting to come here. It was a pleasure. It was, uh, brilliant. So uh, artificial intelligence is en marche in government. OK, five minutes for Q&A. OK, I'm sure you're all quite tired. I'll be very brief. I'd like to thank you, first of all, for this fascinating discussion. My question is quite simple. 
artificial intelligence, okay, but what do we do with it in a way the environment? How can we improve things? Alors, de manière générale, so, in general rule, we will use artificial intelligence to uh, manage all the resources. For instance, it was uh, it can be used to reduce your uh, electricity consumption by 40 percent. So it is amazing, 40 percent less. So also, they want to uh, use it for London City now, but then it is a political decision to implement it or not. Good evening. I'm a founder of the uh, association, the uh, Citizen City. We uh, talk about big data, how we can deal with uh, data, etc. But how can we find ways to uh, consume less energy? Because uh, data consumes a lot of energy. So unfortunately, we haven't addressed that issue yet. So I would like to know if you have answers of microphone. So what I want to say is we shouldn't have a separation, a division between ecology and digital. See, it's off mic, out of microphone. So some technical progresses are being made. Uh, we have uh, more power now to calculate uh, data, etc. So we can imagine that the more objects we will have with the powerful uh, ability to calculate and the easier it will work. And I do believe that the vehicle, electric vehicle, is interesting. So the thing is, there is not a lot of energy used. So it means we don't have to deal with that. We just deal and we just manage with what is rare. So with the electric vehicles, we will have to be careful. And this will be extremely useful. Yes, good evening. So my question is the following. What will all these uh, taxi drivers become and the not qualified workers uh, because of uh, artificial intelligence, intelligence, sorry. So what will become of all these people when they won't have jobs anymore? What will happen? So briefly, extremely briefly, in the past, all the jobs that were destroyed and erased have been uh, rebuilt somewhere else and s somehow in a different way. So this time it will be a bit different, but uh, expertise will still be extremely interesting. You won't go to your GP for the diagnosis, but what we will look for will be the connection between people, communication. So just to add something, there is an interesting uh, TED talk on that topic that is showing uh, a large uh, evolution in banking, for instance, that uh, a lot of uh, jobs will be suppressed, but we produce more wealth. So imagine if it's well distributed, maybe in the next five to 10 years, this ability to use all these digital technologies will allow us probably to create jobs. Maybe people can create their own jobs. They can be freelancers, etc. We will create new wealth zones, but we need to redistribute wealth for that. Something else. You mentioned uh, something. I would like to add the transition time. Of course, let's not be mistaken, and Emmanuel Macron said it, it's, it takes uh, information, it takes time. We will need time to adapt, to adjust, and of course, really rapidly, I, I believe a lot of jobs will be suppressed. We, we don't know 30, 40% jobs uh, 
will be created, new jobs we can't even imagine today will be created. So to what extent? To what extent we don't know, and this is a philosophical question. There was an interview, probably someone from uh, our competitor, the ECO. Someone said that the ultimate goal for AI is to suppress work. So if there is no more work at all, then what can we do? Maybe we can uh, add more human aspect human levels everywhere maybe we will tax devices and robots we don't know maybe we will have a new economic paradigm uh, we don't know uh, one or two last questions maybe so good evening i'm samuel from the uh, fuchsia collective so concerning ai helping cities. Maybe you were mentioning the most recent city of the world. Maybe you don't know where it is. It is Bidi Bidi in Uganda, and it's composed of refugees, Sudan, the refugees that are flying, that are escaping their country. So how could AI help these people? Because at the moment, they don't have infrastructures. There are no roads. So what is your view? I believe that a lot is being doing. I uh, have this app. It is called Tex Fujis that is uh, implemented to help those people. I believe technology can help, but we still need human beings to be uh, there, to be present. So Tex Fujis, it's Tex, Tex and Fujis. So it's a mixture of the two words. So, of course, I do believe we need machines and we need people as well. So there are a number of NGOs that are trying to deal with these gigantic refugee camps. So it is a new reflection at the uh, global level. to have NGOs dealing with the data in a different way. There is a different uh, culture of uh, protecting data, of protecting people, that allows to human assemblies, like the one you are describing, refugees, to find human aspect. So it is very interesting what is happening. And it is a global, straight away, it is already a global process. So it's like a hybridation of different cultures at the international level. Of mic. So they have more luck than we do. So rapidly, apparently they are more successful than we are. Because they straight away use the latest technologies helped with NGOs. So it's about a mobile payment. Let's imagine all these countries, uh, for them, Facebook, Facebook is sending uh, balloons to help them connect to te new technologies. So these countries do not have legacy to deal with that situation. So it can go faster. So yes, I do agree with what you said. These cities do not have fixed uh, landlines. But let's not think that we will bring those population technology. But the thing is, this population, they don't have uh, stereotypes, and they will probably come up with new solutions. They will invent things. So off mic. So thank you to everyone, says uh, the moderator, facilitator. And good evening. <laughs>